Good afternoon, and thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Kendra Sakamoto. I'm a librarian here at West Vancouver Memorial Library. Uh, while I recognize that we are all in different places this afternoon, I would like to acknowledge that for those of us on the North Shore, we are on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam Nations. If you are uncertain as to which ancestral territory you live on, I encourage you to visit whose.land to learn more about the traditional lands on which you reside. Today we have the opportunity to learn about the many plants of this region and their traditional uses. I am deeply thankful to the Coast Salish peoples who are working to maintain this traditional knowledge and who have been the careful caretakers of these lands and waters since time immemorial. I am truly grateful to be able to call this place home. Unfortunately, Luce Chim will not be able to join us today. However, we are delighted to have Nancy Turner with us who will present on behalf of Luce Chim and herself. A distinguished professor emerita in environmental studies at the University of Victoria, Nancy Turner is an ethnobotanist who has worked with Indigenous elders and cultural specialists in Western Canada for over 50 years. Learning about traditional knowledge of plants and environments and helping to document this knowledge for future generations. She has authored or co-authored, co-edited over 30 books and over 150 book chapters and papers. She has received a number of awards for her work, including the Order of Canada, the Order of British Columbia, and fellowship in the Royal Society of Canada, as well as honorary degrees from four BC universities. She has been delighted to work with and learn from Dr. Nishim Arvid Charlie over the past 15 plus years and to help produce Lushim's plants in his honor. Welcome, Nancy. I also want to acknowledge, as Kendra did, the First Nations of our region and right across the country, but on the lower mainland there, uh, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish nations um, in the Vancouver area. And uh, over on our side, the Coets and, and Snenemach and the other uh, peoples of the Salish Sea region. And, and to extend sincere gratitude for these people for caring for this region and its resources for so many millennia. Aichka, Aichka. Some of the plants that we'll be talking about, uh, the quamchults or the bog cranberry is one of the important fruits of the uh, peat bog or muskeg areas. And uh, one of the tubers, the edible tubers, the quolts, uh, the wapato, that the Cowichan people got from the Fraser Estuary. And uh, this James family, his mother and others remember well um, going over to the Cowich, to the Fraser River Estuary and harvesting uh, the Wapato there and bringing it back and even planting some in some of the lakes uh, in the Gulf Islands. And of course, the wild rose, my favorite. I want to acknowledge Howard White and Charlotte, Rebecca, Nicola, and all the Harbor Publishing team for the care that they took in producing our book. And to our families, uh, this team's wife, Darlene, and, and his, his whole family are just remarkable people. And my husband, Bob, who did a lot, of, a lot of photography, I call him my personal photographer and much more and uh, all of our family as well for their support of this project over the years. To Kendra and to others who are also uh, sponsoring different book launch events uh, over at the Cowichan Estuary tomorrow and uh, at the Nanaimo Art Gallery later on. And here's Howard White sitting on our couch with our dog, Annie. He said it's fine to, he, he would be honored to be uh, pictured there with Annie as part of the acknowledgement. Kendra, for some reason, I can't seem to, oh, maybe we'll try this. There we are. I want to tell you a little more about Luce Chim, Dr. Arvid Charlie. 
He received an honorary degree from Vancouver Island University some years ago, and uh, it's certainly a well-deserved honor that reflects just in part some of the amazing knowledge that he holds. Not only was he raised by his wonderful parents, Simon and Violet Charlie, Simon uh, was a well-known artist and carver of the, the Duncan area, the Cowichan area. Uh, but he, he also, by his, uh, his great-grandmother and his great-grandfather, whose name was Luschim, whose name Luschim himself has inherited. And, and the original Luschim was born in 1870. So you can see the uh, extent of the knowledge that Luschim, our Luschim today holds, that extends back, if you, if you look back through the generations, to a time before Europeans had arrived on in their territory at all. And, um, and so some of the knowledge that Luschim has uh, holds is not known to very many people at all. In fact, some, in some cases, he's the only one who knows some of this knowledge about the land and about plants. And he has, as I said, a wonderful family, um, but it was his extraordinary training by his elders and experience and uh, as, a, as a forester, as a logger, as a fisherman, uh, a traveler. He's been a teacher of the Kawatsun, uh, culture and the whole Kamenum language for many years. He's a medicine practitioner. He's a canoe journey leader, and he's a mentor to many, many people, young people, both whole Kamenum and uh, non-whole Kamenum, non-indigenous people. Um, he's a teacher for, first and foremost. And I think it's very fitting that uh, we're talking today um, after the, the Day of Reconciliation, um, because the work that we're doing together, I hope, will be seen as an act of reconciliation, working together to promote this amazing, rich knowledge that um, this team is willing to share. So the Cowichan tribes are a diverse group of people with multiple villages traditionally uh, located around the entire Cowichan Valley uh, and around the Cowichan and Shawnigan Lakes into the Gulf Islands, onto Lulu Island in the Fraser River in the South Arm where there was a village, Tortinas, that Luschim and his ancestors uh, would travel to each year and some people lived there year round. I was at the uh, Museum of Anthropology at UBC and I was delighted to see there a fishing lure that had been carved and donated to the museum by uh, Luschim's father, Simon Charlie. And uh, so that's a lure that is pushed deep down into the water uh, and by a long pole. And then the pole is jerked out and the lure itself uh, it floats up to the surface with a twirling action, a rotating action that attracts the fish, uh, the cod and, and other fish that come up to the surface after the lure, where the fisherman is wading in his canoe to, uh, with his uh, spear to, to spear the fish when it comes up. So imagine Luschim, and his great grandfather and all that that the great grandfather Luschim knew and experienced in his lifetime, going back to the decades into the uh, 19th century, uh, when people were still fishing with weirs on the Cowichan and the other rivers, um, where they they had uh, free use of the land all around that area from the uh, all, all around Lake Cowich and the mountains around there uh, for hunting, the Gary Oak Meadows, the peat bogs, the rivers and wetlands. All of these are areas that Luschim 
the great grandfather would have known and had access to and uh, the knowledge about how to make fishing weirs, how to make the canoes um, and all of the all of the things that people needed to live in a sustainable way on the land, Luschim was an expert at. I love to think about that time and what uh, what people would have been doing then. So today, um, just give an introduction to the area of the uh, Hokumitnam uh, territory. Uh, and talk about some of the important plants that were important to the Kowitsun uh, and ways that people tended and managed and looked after the plant resources that they relied on, the changes that have taken place and, and just end on a note that there's tremendous renewal and restoration, what one could call eco-cultural restoration happening throughout uh, this territory and beyond. And um, I think that's a, um, a very positive, um, something that's progressing right now and I think we'll continue to build on. So I mentioned some of the types of areas that is part of the Cowichan territory. Um, one of the most important for the Cowichan people, as well as for the Saanich and the other Strait Salish people, the Songhees and, and Salk people, uh, is the Gary Oak Meadow or Gary Oak Savanna, which is a mixture of Gary Oak uh, woodland and open clearings and prairies where all kinds of different culturally important plants exist with some bushy areas in between. And this particular ecosystem, the Gary Oak ecosystem, which is part of the, the dry subzone of the coastal Douglas fir zone uh, found on Vancouver Island and, uh, and vicinity in the Gulf Islands, is very rare in Canada. It's the most, one of the most biodiverse and endangered ecosystems in all of Canada, partly because uh, Climatically, it's very pleasant area to live in. It's called a Mediterranean climate. So it has warm summers and relatively warm, wet winters. Um, and you find a particular constellation of plants and animals that live in this zone that are not found anywhere else in all of Canada. But what a lot of people do not realize and that I'll be talking a little bit about later is that this is an anthropogenic landscape. This is a landscape that was created in part by people, by their activities using fire and other means of clearing and tending these areas to maintain the prairie lands and uh, to, pr to promote the production of camas and the delta balsam root and the other plants that people relied on for food, materials and medicine. So I'll be talking about that a little bit more later. The coastal Douglas fir biogeoclimatic zone, which is just another way of saying a vegetation zone that is influenced by the geography and the climate of, of the area and has a particular suite of different of plants that, that really prefer to grow in that particular habitat. Uh, at plants and animals as well, and fungi as well. We need to consider the fungi, of course, because they're another kingdom of organisms that are equally important, but often not recognized as such. So we have to think uh, about what's happened to this area. If you look on a map, you'll see uh, the southeast part of Vancouver Island um, is, is the, the area where the coastal Douglas fir zone occurs uh, in the rain shadow of the Vancouver Island Mountains and the Olympic Mountains of Washington. And the trees that grow there, the vegetation that grows there, um, the old growth trees are almost all cut down because Douglas fir is a prime uh, timber tree for loggers. 
And uh, in the Cowichan Valley, if you drive up the east coast of Vancouver Island, there's hardly any of the big old growth Douglas fir left anywhere. Um, and there's a few little isolated spots. You can see some old growth um, in some of the park areas, but mostly any extensive old growth forests on the east southeast coast of Vancouver Island have been mostly um, destroyed uh, by logging. And there are second growth forests that are quite old and there are third growth forests in some areas. But if you look at the logging trucks coming up and down the island now, even the ones with Douglas fir, they're mostly pretty small little logs. So uh, Luz Chim and others would call them toothpicks, I think, because they're just tiny compared with the original Douglas firs, which you'd need multiple people with their hands stretched out to go around one of them. So they can grow up to a thousand years old, uh, eight or 900 years old, they're very common. The large trees are fire resistant. You can see here, uh, this big old Douglas fir is scarred with black charcoal. It shows that this, there was a fire that came through here and burned up the trunk, but the thick bark protected the inner part of the tree. And this tree is still, still living. Say, say is the Hokumitnam name for the Douglas fir. Uh, then on the west coast of the island and all the way up to Alaska on the west coast and the lowland areas, you find a wetter moisture zone called the coastal western hemlock zone, where uh, western red cedar is common, western hemlock, sitka spruce, um, red alder is very common. Pacific yew is very common. And um, all of these are trees that were available to the Hokumetnam people in the wetter areas of their territory. And all of them have important cultural uses. And if you go up into the subalpine forest zone, you'll which is called the mountain hemlock zone here on the island, you'll see a, another suite of trees. You see a lot of lodgepole pine, a lot of yellow cedar, um, and a lot of um, mountain hemlock. Uh, and as you see, if you climb up Mount Coakley and around Mount Aerosmith, and in the mountains around Lake Cowichan as well, you'll see this uh, other forest zone where people would go very frequently for a lot of reasons, for hunting, for harvesting yellow cedar bark, um, for fishing in the upland lakes, and for spiritual uh, purposes as well, people would access these areas. I had a wonderful trip up, uh, up into the mountainous area around Mount Aerosmith with Luce Team and his family some years ago now. And I'll never forget the time we had a lot of fun exchanging knowledge, um, my knowledge as a botanist and his knowledge as a plant expert from his nation. Um, we just really enjoyed that trip so much. Some of the information in the book comes from that time. So as I mentioned before, these different habitats, we think of them as vegetation zones, but they're, they're biocultural systems because people have been living and using these areas for millennia, going back um, at least 10,000 years more in, in some areas. Some of the oldest sites we know on the coast are 14,000, 15,000 years old back when there was ice covering a good part of the continent, but there were areas still that people lived in and accessed over those areas. And certainly Luzchim and his ancestors and the Musqueam and the others who are all related to each other um, lived in the lower mainland area um, going back countless thousands of years. There's Luz Chim, he's just ready to harvest some lichen here, uh, the old man speared lichen, which he uses uh, as a medical practitioner, as a particular medicine. 
And of course, um, we're going to focus on the plant knowledge today because um, that's my area that I feel I can contribute in. And uh, we, this is what we worked on together, the different ways that plants featured in the Cowichan Coats and people's life ways for food, materials, medicines. And um, although the book doesn't contain any details for the spiritual and ceremonial purposes, because those are private, uh, that's private knowledge that is passed on very personally and, and um, experientially from one generation to the next within the people who have the right to that kind of knowledge. But in general, it's good for you to know which plants are used and, and are important spiritually, as well as for these other uses. So here we have cattail, typha. We have a mixture of berries that are related to the raspberries. We have salmon berries and trailing blackberries, the two colors of salmon berries here. And we have sword fern, we have uh, red huckleberries, uh, and we have uh, the shredded or the peeled bark of Devil's Club, which is one of the important medicines. Wherever it grows, up and down the coast, up to Alaska, east into the uh, the Kootenays and Shwetmukh territory. And here we have a boat, probably a canoe on Lake Couch, and I'm thinking. People live in, live in permanent villages, but throughout the season, different plants are available and they would travel in family groups or sometimes hunters would travel to different areas at different times of the year. This is sometimes called the seasonal round. They start in the early spring to go out to the ocean, to the islands for herring fishing, getting herring eggs. Um, Fishing, getting the green shoots and green vegetables, the inner bark of trees, the seaweed in the spring. In the early summer, they'd be harvesting camas bulbs and wild strawberries and salmon berries. And then berries all through the summer, um, different berries get ripe. People would be harvesting cedar bark for their basketry and mats and clothing cattails later in the summer for their mats, medicines throughout the time. In the fall, different berries are ripe, the bog cranberries and the high bush cranberries, the crab apples and so forth. Nettle fiber is ready in the early fall for making string or rope, uh, fish nets and so forth. Um, medicines like the true furs, the grand fir and the subalpine fir and amabilis fir, which produces a really highly high quality medicine from its uh, pitch blisters on the trunks. Bracken fern rhizomes were harvested in the fall, and so were the clover and silverweed roots. Um, teas and other plants could be harvested during the winter, but most of the time people live during the the coldest winter months uh, on food that people had stored from the rest of the year. And that was a time when, a sacred time when people spent time in the big house and there were feasts and there were different ceremonies that took place over that time. So I'll just mention a few examples of the culturally important plants that Liz Chim has taught me about over time, and maybe even read a few quotes from him now and again, uh, because we spent over the years, we probably made 20 or 30 different uh, meetings where I recorded the, uh, con our conversations about plants, and then I transcribed them. So uh, the book has a lot of direct quotes from Luz Jean uh, talking about the different plants. And some of those I'll, I'll share with you here. But all in all, about 120 to 130 different species of plants, algae and fungi were named 
are named in the Hokkamitnam language. People are still um, are still really um, practicing speaking the Hokkamitnam language. They're, they're Hokkamitnam language teachers in many of the schools. And some of the younger people in the Hokkamitnam area are speaking that language um, fluently, which is a great satisfaction to people like Lucien, who has spent uh, a lifetime ensuring that that kind of knowledge is passed on. And the language is such an important part of the whole knowledge system. Not only the names of the plants, but words for different processes that go on and all of that specialized vocabulary, the places where people harvest things, those are really important. Not just the conversation of hello and how are you, but these important, very specialized terms are part of the language that's being held and revitalized and renewed um, right, right at the current time. So here we have, um, and you have to forgive me, I am not a linguist and I'm not, I, I will hesitate to try to repeat some of the names of the plants because I don't want you to hear the, the wrong pronunciation. But you can go to First Voices on the web and you can um, search for different names of these plants and you will hear an Indigenous speaker uh, pronounce those names properly. But I'll just give a try for this one because it's short and sweet. Um, and the, that apostrophe after the Q is kind of, is called glottalized, a glottalized consonant. So instead of which is pronounced back in the throat, it's um, bull kelp. The long, long stems that are anchored deep in the water with a bulb on the top and then the uh, fronds that come from the bulb. The entire uh, kelp plant or kelp uh, organism is, is important. But the stipes, the long stems, if you found them on the beach and tried to break them, you'll know how tough they are. Um, so these were used, uh, were cured and used for making rope or fishing line. And as Lucien said, you can, if you're out fishing, you can tie your canoe or your boat to the kelp in a kelp bed and use that as an anchor for when you're fishing. And when you're making a bow made from yew wood, you can put it inside the uh, kelp and put it uh, under the ashes of a fire and heat it up. And, and then you can take it out and bend the yew wood very uh, carefully and slowly when it's heated and when it's moistened from the kelp. And that's how to keep the bow flexible, limber and springy, Lucien said. Um, as well, sometimes people harvested the herring eggs from the fronds of the kelp and they stored oil or some other liquids in the bulb, in the hollow bulbous part of the kelp after curing it. So this is a very, very useful alga that we find. And kelp beds, as many of you will know, are an important habitat for all kinds of marine life from sea urchins and and sea stars to uh, all the little creatures that the salmon feed on, as well as the, the little young salmon themselves take refuge in the kelp beds. Some of you are divers and you'll know uh, close up what these look like, these wonderful habitats. And here is Tuto Alakup, which is sort of like, uh, echo, echo maker. Um, and that's a tree fungus. There's several, many different kinds that grow on the trees, standing trees or dead trees, snags. And these all have a sort of a spiritual capacity of uh, reflecting back. So uh, it's, it's said that when you call out in the woods, this is what, if you hear an echo, it comes from the tree fungus. As Lucien says, it is in charge of the echoes. That's its job here on earth, to look after the echoes. 
And some of these uh, tree fungi are used medicinally. Um, some of them are used to make tinder. You can light, you can dry them and light them and they'll hold a coal for a long time. And you can put that coal inside of a, a double clam shell or wrapped in a tube of cedar bark or something. And you can carry fire with you that way using the tree fungus. This is the artist's fungus, the Ganoderma. And when it's fresh, you can draw on the white underside of it and it will turn brown and you can make pictures and then dry the fungus and the pictures will stay. So it's a surface um, that, that can be used for art in that way. And um, the name is also sometimes used for telephone. No, no, not surprisingly, because of the echo uh, capacity of a telephone. Some of you will know this tall, skinny, scratchy plant, um, the, the giant, the branchless horsetail, it's called. There, there are many plants uh, in this group, in a group uh, in their own family, in their own um, class uh, and division but sometimes called fern allies because they're spore bearing plants like the ferns. They don't have seeds, they produce spores. And this one in particular, some of you will know, you can take those segments and pull them apart. And they say that the, if they're growing in a wet place, at least in the bottom part, there's a bit of water. And if you're thirsty and you need some fresh water, you can pull one of those apart, then you can drink the water in there. It will be it will be pure, even if it's growing in a swampy area and you wouldn't want to drink the water there from the swamp. But uh, one of the qualities of the horsetail is that it's scratchy um, because it has silicon embedded in the cells. Silicon is the main ingredient in salt, in, in sand. And so they call it sandpaper. And you can use it as an abrasive to polish your wooden carving items or even soapstone or other materials for your knitting needles that you might make out of ocean spray or some other wood, maybe your arrows. And uh, this plant is also used as a medicine uh, that, as Lucien said, uh, if you make it into a tea or you chew on it, it helps your singing voice and there are various other uses for it as well. You can make whistles from those hollow little segments of the horse tail, and you can make a pan pipe from them too because different sizes have different pitches to them. So if you can put together several of different sizes, you can make different tones from them, which is a lot of fun to do with kids. A relative of the branchless horse tail is, is this giant horsetail and its small relative, the common horsetail, all in the genus Equisetum. And uh, this one is called Skhamkham, Skhamkham. And this one actually is eaten in its very young form. Uh, the horsetails have, as I mentioned, they produce spores from a kind of a cone structure, strobilis, which is shown here in this picture. Um, this one is a little overripe. It's already producing ripe spores, but in its very young stage, before the spores are ready to be released, you can pull out this whole structure, this spore bearing shoot of the giant horsetail. You peel off the scurfy part of the stem, which I call the skirt, and you can eat the inside part as a green vegetable in the spring. Um, it's also a source of water. If you're thirsty, you can eat them. As Lucien says, they're watery. And he says the only ones we eat are a golden color, about four inches from the ground. So um, yeah, they grow up. And then uh, in the springtime, they produce their spores and those spore bearing parts of the plant die back. And then the leafy, the vegetative part, which you can see here, is just a shoot, starts to grow up and it can be very tall. As you can see here, these ones are about a meter tall and they're scratchy like the other one. You can use them for sandpaper and as an abrasive in the same way. 
and they're also used medicinally. Scham kham. And then we have the sword fern, a very beautiful fern with uh, that comes up and it has little um, uh, fiddleheads in the early spring. It's an evergreen fern, so although it suffered a lot this year, this summer from the drought, uh, in moister places we still have sword ferns that survived over the summer, and they'll produce shoots that grow up. Um, in, in the following spring, and eventually the older fronds will die back, but af only after they're a year or two old. And this is known as a sacred plant for the um, Coats and, and other First Nations as well. Um, the, the fronds are used uh, in sacred ceremonies and ceremonial bathing and in the winter dances. So we think about these things, how important and sacred these plants are. And um, it, it really hurts when I see uh, them just being along a roadside, just being cut back uh, by a mower or something like that. Because to me, um, these plants are just beautiful and special. Um, and, and I know they are to Los Chim and others. They're used uh, in the first salmon ceremony, for example, for uh, carrying the very first salmon that's caught in the, in the spring or in the summer, the sockeye. Um, and it's carried up and ceremonially cooked and shared amongst the people. Uh, in the early days, the salmon ceremony would take four days of uh, of singing and special uh, ceremonies to thank the salmon for their contributions to people. To thank the salmon as a relative that gives itself to people for their survival. And then we have the little licorice fern, a seep. A seep is, uh, is a name that's used by in a number of different Salish languages as well as in the Dididat language. And this little fern grows not in clumps like the sword fern, but it grows spread out because it grows from an underground stem or rhizome that's about as thick as your little finger. And it grows under the moss on rocky areas, but also on tree trunks where there's a lot of moss, especially maple trees. The sword, the, the licorice fern, the seep, loves to grow on maple trees um, because that's those the bark of the maple is rich in calcium. If you did, you can take a little bit, you dig under the moss and just break off a little bit of the end of the rhizome of this licorice fern and you can taste it. It has a very, very sweet taste. In fact, it has a compound in it called polypodicide A, which is named after this fern. Um, that is said to be about 600 times sweeter than sugar. And so it's used to sweeten the mouth as a flavoring, to sweeten tea and to sweeten medicine that might be made from tree bark and be a little bit bitter tasting. So you can just chew on the, the root and you swallow the juice. As Luz Chim said, it's also good for your voice. You know, when you're singing for a long time, uh, you're at a loud voice, it can really um, impact your voice. So uh, making a tea or chewing and swallowing the juice of the root uh, really helps soothe your throat. And um, the ones growing on rock, uh, good for coughs, colds, and sore throats. Also the ones growing on the maple trees. And then we have, as I mentioned before, the true furs. There are three furs um, that are related to each other, and they're known as true furs in contrast with Douglas fir, which is called fir, but is <clears throat> actually more closely related to hemlock. The true furs in the genus Abbeys, sometimes called balsam furs, which is the, the true name for Abbeys balsamia, which is an Eastern relative of these three. And they have their own names as well. Um, the grand fir is the most common at lower elevations. 
it has very flat branches. And if you look at the needles closely, they're notched at the tip. And if you just break off the needles and smell them, they have the most delicious, fragrant uh, smell. And um, you can make a tea from the needles. But as I mentioned before, the young trees of each of these have uh, blisters on the bark. And if you were to press one of those blisters, you get some liquid pitch, very, very sticky, but very fragrant and aromatic, um, made with, um, yeah, made with uh, a mixture of resins and aromatic oils. And this medicine is used as a medicine for colds and coughs and can make a salve for sores, also used in hair shampoo. Um, and the bark is used for dye and uh, for medicine as a wash for cleansing traps to take the human scent and for removing the scent of, of uh, hunting equipment and so forth. The boughs of each of these are used to make bedding. And uh, you can imagine what a fragrant bed they would make. The Amabilis fir grows more on the west coast and the subalpine fir is uh, found in the subalpine forests. All of these are known to the Cowichan people. And then we have the yellow cedar, Pashalakwa, uh, which has an, a number of different uses as well. Um, the inner bark is really fine. It makes the very best clothing. It's even finer than the inner bark of the western red cedar at lower elevations. And as Luce Ching said with a smile, you have to go up high to get it. And he said, you know the man of the house isn't lazy if there's yellow cedar bark in, in the house and in their house, uh, in, in their blankets and so forth. You know that, uh, that, that the man of the house would have gone up high to get the cedar bark, which he'd bring back down to make the blankets and the baby clothing and so forth. Um, and as he mentioned, also the yellow cedar wood is easy to carve and it makes paddles. Um, and even um, in the uh, ceremonial blankets, they have the paddles, uh, little small paddles that are sewn across the shirts of the ceremonial dancers. and. These are, paddles are often made from the yellow cedar wood, also used for, for dishes, although it has a slight uh, rank smell to it, um, the bark. You can tell the smell of the yellow cedar when, even when you're walking up in the subalpine, you can smell it. So it's not good for some things that are, come in contact with food. And then we have another uh, tree with a very strong smell, uh, um, uh, means small, uh, strong smell. The Rocky Mountain, sorry, the Pacific Coastal Juniper. It used to be in the same uh, genus and the same species as the Rocky Mountain Juniper, Juniper, Juniper scopulorum. But then uh, botanists found that it's actually genetically quite different from the interior. Uh, juniper, Rocky Mountain Juniper, and so it now has its own species name, Juniperus maritima, and you find it growing all around the coast, uh, especially as you can see it here, around the Gulf Islands, um, and in special places around the territory. Um, and as Luce Jean points out, it's really not stinky. Uh, it has a strong smell, but the smell is actually quite pleasant. And it's used for bathing, it's used in the sweat lodge uh, for producing uh, a cleansing uh, uh, vapor. And it's used for cleaning the house if you need to cleanse for some reason. Um, it's used in ceremonial ways uh, as well. So this is a very, very special tree, also important in the interior where it's called punch again named after its strong smell in all of the different Salish languages up in the interior, punch or punchlap. And then we have the lodgepole pine, 
which is called the dancing plant, if you translate the word, the name. And I, again, I won't try and pronounce this. I don't want to say it wrong. I wish this team were here to be able to say it properly for you. Um, I know he'd laugh at me if I tried to pronounce it, but it's funny, Lucien showed me why it's called the dancing plant. It's just amazing. If you take uh, one of the, the twigs with the needles on it and put it upside down on a tray and you just tap the tray, the, the branch will dance on the needle twigs if you turn it. Um, and, it, and it dances around just like in the winter dances, the people dancing. And that's why they call it the dancing tree. It's used variously medicinally. The pitch is used sometimes for caulking baskets or caulking canoes. It's also used uh, as a medicinal salve. So this is a really important tree that you find both at the upper elevations and along the coast. And in peat bogs, especially, it's, it's a very versatile tree. And then we have the white pine, which used to be, Lucien told me, uh, when he was young, there was white pine everywhere. And some of the trees were so big, uh, if they were fallen logs, you could not climb over them. They were so big. And he remembers that from being in forestry. When, when he started logging in the early 60s, that's what he talked about, the trees that had fallen down in Copper Canyon. You couldn't climb up on them, they were so big. And so um, this was such an important tree, but it, it was vulnerable and uh, susceptible to the Eastern white pine blister rust, rust, which was introduced to our area. And so it died out and now we don't think of it as being a common element of our forests here, but um, we need to see if we can bring it back. There's still a few places where it does grow, maybe some trees that are resistant to the blister rust. And uh, as Luce Jean said, the branches are used, they're very aromatic, used to descent traps and the pitch can be gathered in large quantities. If you make just a, a wound the tree a little bit, it will produce a lot of pitch. And you can create a medicine tree that way, just by cutting into the living tree and, and then going, coming back later to collect the pitch that is produced. And you can keep that as a pitch tree for years and years, sometimes for generations, the same tree. And then we have the Douglas fir, which is used for many different purposes and is highly venerated because it grows to be so old. The young sapling trees, um, the poles, are really important for uh, fishing gear. You can see here, this is a Nkikatmuch man on the Fraser River around Lytton, but he's using a, a dip net to catch salmon in, in a very similar uh, type of dip net that the Cowichan people would use as well, made from the poles of the young Douglas fir, for spears and gaffs, for walking sticks. Um, and as Lucien said, um, when they were living on the Fraser River, especially during the sturgeon season in the, in the winter time, they would use uh, a spear made from the the saplings of the Douglas fir. The pitch wood of, the, of a Douglas fir, you find in the center of an old stump. If you're out and you don't have, um, you don't have rain, uh, sorry, you have a rainy weather and you don't have any way of uh, keeping a fire going, you can find an old Douglas fir stump and you break into the middle part and you'll find this wood that's saturated with pitch. And all you need is a spark or two to keep that, to make that uh, light up. And you can make torches from it or use it as uh, for starting fires. People also did pit lamping, that is hunting with the torch at night um, for ducks and, and sometimes for fish. But as loose chain worms, don't use that pitch wood for cooking because it will taint the food, it will make it very strong smelling. 
it seems ironic because the thick bark of the Douglas fir protects the tree from a forest fire, from the heat of a fire. But if you can remove the bark, uh, the thick slabs of bark from the Douglas fir, they're one of the hottest burning fuels you'll ever be able to find. My friend, Dr. Darcy Mitchell, Matthews, sorry, Dr. Darcy Matthews, has um, did his PhD work on culturally modified Douglas fir trees. And he found that uh, First Nations were cutting slabs of big old Douglas fir trees um, in, on Vancouver Island uh, using elk antler wedges, taking these big slabs and using them as fuel. And so he found this whole class of what they call culturally modified trees, big old Douglas fir trees that have uh, evidence of a slab taken off from the living tree. And he didn't, the slabs were taken without damaging the growing cell layers of the tree. So the tree continues to grow, but you can see where that slab was taken off because the the trunk is flattened in that area. You can find those culturally modified Douglas fir trees in many parts of Vancouver Island where there are older Douglas fir trees growing, even if there's just a couple. So, I see it's almost, um, almost 12 o'clock. And uh, the time is going, so I'm going to go a little bit faster here. Um, Carpate is the western red cedar, a wonderful tree, sometimes called the cornerstone of Northwest Coast indigenous cultures because it's used for so many different things. The wood is, uh, you can split it, it splits easily, and um, you can make canoes good canoes, but as Liz Chain points out, your canoes on the river, you don't want to make from a straight grained cedar tree. You need one with lots of branches and knots in it, because then if it hits a rock, it won't split open when you're going up to the falls or through the falls. The bark has multiple purposes used for, um, used, used for mats, clothing, rope, um, basketry. I have a cedar, a cedar bark basket here, which I might show you after a while when we finish this. This is a very spiritual plant as well, and it's used in ceremony for ceremonial bathing and in other uh, ceremonies. Lustine is here beside a big old cedar tree, and there's a culturally modified cedar which shows the respect that people have for the cedar trees. Yes, they use the trees, but they wouldn't kill the tree unless they needed it for a canoe. They would just take a single strip of bark from the tree and then it, they would leave it to grow back. Uh, and eventually that tree would heal over it. That's called a culturally modified tree. We have thousands and thousands of culturally modified cedar trees up and down the coast, including in Holcomitnam. Cowitzen territory. And then we have the bow plant, the bow tree, the Pacific yew, which has very, very tough, strong wood and is valued uh, for making implements like digging sticks and wedges and fish hooks. The wood is springy and you can treat it, as he said, to make it more flexible. But yew is also known as a good medicine, both the needles and the bark and you can harvest the medicine from standing living trees. Um, a place on the north side of the Cowichan River is called the little yew tree, and the name means the same as bow. So that's just one example of uh, the importance of this wonderful tree. And then we have the common of the paddle tree. It's called the big leaf maple, and you can see the licorice ferns growing on this big leaf maple tree. This has the largest leaves of any deciduous tree in Canada. And um, as Lucien recalled, when he, when he is out hunting, 
if you kill a deer, uh, you would dress it right there. They would clean it and fill the cavity with maple leaves and fireweed plants. And that helps the process of seasoning the meat. And as he said, gives it a really sweet taste. And as the name implies, maple wood is really valued for making paddles, um, just like the yellow cedar, and also for spindle whorls, for um, spinning wool. Then we have the red alder, aptly named because the bark produces a bright red dye, or it can be an orange or brown dye, depending on how it's prepared. But people also ate the inner bark of the alder in the springtime, early May, even before that. And Lucine said it gets a bit bitter in, uh, in the summertime. Uh, and the wood is good for making bowls, and it's also an excellent wood for smoking fish. And then we have willow, swala. Squala is uh, the name for the reef net, and swala ashp is the reef net uh, plant, ashp being the suffix that's used on many plant names that makes it a uh, bush or tree. Used for the bark is very tough and is used for fish traps. Also as a medicine, as uh, willow is the original source of acetyl salicylic acid or, or uh, willow acid, salicylic acid. Many different kinds of willow. Then we have cascara, um, not used not only for its more famous uh, medicinal use of using as a laxative uh, medicine, but the wood is also a uh, favorite for carving. And his uh, dad, his team's dad, Simon Charlie, used um, cascara wood for carving many different kinds of tool handles, especially. Then we have the Pacific crabapple, Kwa'op. And um, the crabapple is not only a source of really important fruit in the late summer and fall, uh, but, but the wood is very tough and is used for, um, for digging sticks and for bows. And uh, Luz Jim remembers when he was growing up, the grouse really liked crabapples. And so hunters would look for crabapple trees if they wanted to find a grouse, they could find a place where the the grouse were roosting. I'm just a little conscious of the time. I want to leave time for questions. So um, um, also Kendra said that she would make this uh, PowerPoint available to you so you can uh, look at it later on and, and read some of the detail that I haven't been able to share with you. But we have the bitter cherry tree here, Tullum. The berries, the cherries are quite bitter, although they used to eat them if they were thirsty. But the, the bark is the part that's used mainly. Uh, it's used as for basketry decoration and for wrapping implements of all kinds, the halves of bows and um, the uh, joints of implements, very important, as well as a medicine tree. Lucien made me a walking stick of uh, bitter cherry wood um, because I had a sore leg at the time. And he said it's got medicinal qualities even in the walking stick. I mentioned the cherry bark is used for decoration for baskets. Here again at the Museum of Anthropology at UBC is a couch and baby cradle that's decor it's made from the split root of cedar, western red cedar, and decorated with strips of red cherry bark, as well as strips of the stems of reed canary grass. And there is some of the cherry bark, that's a tullum that is curled up there beside the leaves of the bitter cherry. And as I mentioned before, people didn't just um, go and take uh, the, the plant resources that they needed. They looked after them, they tended them. They were careful in, in selecting what they needed and not taking more than they needed. 
they uh, created particular habitats and extended them through clearing and burning. They tilled the soil, they weeded, they replanted, they pruned the berry bushes and different families and, and communities had responsibility, the ownership um, of different areas that they would look after and supervise the use of and uh, spreading the resource harvesting areas across the territory was another management method as well as ceremonial management like the first salmon ceremony where which would have lasted for days when the first salmon was caught allowing days for the salmon to, to continue their run with a, until before people started catching them for them for the winter use so medicinal bark was harvested for example in just patches they wouldn't girdle the tree, but they would take a patch. Here's a culturally modified alder tree that has uh, had a medicine patch taken from it and it's starting to grow over. Cottonwood, used for uh, a lot of different purposes, sometimes for a dugout canoe. Uh, the roots were used for shampoo, for, um, for laundry soap. The buds were used for making a medicinal salve and cosmetic it has a sweet smell to it that you can smell in the spring. Saskatoon berries, not only the berries are eat, eaten, but the wood is used for dip nets and for the hoops for the dip nets. And here's the, uh, the bush that has very hard wood, sometimes called ironwood or ocean, ocean spray. Um, is used for digging sticks, arrows, and knitting needles, mat making needles, and dip net hoops. Um, and sometimes they would coppice or burn down the bushes to create lots of fresh straight shoots that would be good for needles and so forth. And the uh, also used for medicine. And then we have the red osier dogwood. The berries are edible but quite bitter. Um, but they also um, used the bark as a medicine for bee stings and swellings and sores to draw the poison out. And it's also used in sacred purposes, um, making sweat lodges and use in the sweat lodge. We have the hazelnut, which um, is, is very well known, not just for the nuts, which are very popular, um, but the flexible branches of hazel are used uh, for making dip net hoops. And the salal daka, daka, that means the, the name for the berries. And uh, a favorite type of fruit that's harvested in the late summer and used dried to make berry cakes. Um, and the same word is used for liver, given the color of the berries, a high energy food. Uh, and the branches are used in pit cooking, the leaves. Then we have Oregon grape. You can eat the berries, although they're quite tart, but used as a thirst, thirst quencher. The inner bark is used to make uh, yellow dye. And uh, there are two different species, the low one and the, up, the tall one, which are given different names in the Hokumitnam language. I mentioned Devil's Club earlier, very, very important plant used. Uh, nowadays, many people take a tea of Devil's Club uh, as a decoction and a tonic for diabetes and other purposes. Luschim himself uh, harvests medicine for people in need and he's always careful when he's harvesting the Devil's Club to take a couple sections uh, from the stem of the devil's club which can grow to be a very old age so you take the the stems from the daughter plants and you take a set segment of the stem and push it into the muddy wet muddy ground near where he took the the plant from and it will root itself and grow into new plants so that's one way of keeping the population going then we have wonderful uh the tea plant, the Labrador tea, uh, which you get in peat bogs and people really enjoy it. Valdez Island um, 
it was a place where people went to pick that with the permission from the Laxan people. We have the stink currant, just juicy, sweet, actually quite flavorful berries, and also used um, as, sorry, sorry, also used medicinally. Um, but Lucine really enjoyed those berries. We have the gooseberries as well. Um, that name is used not only in the Salishan languages, but borrowed into the Kwakwala language to the north and various other languages. And these berries are really enjoyed, uh, very flavorful, and the stems are good medicine. All the other berries related to the raspberry group, the huckleberry, sorry, the black caps, the thimbleberries, the salmon berries, the trailing blackberries, all relatives that people really enjoyed and made into cakes. And for the thimbleberry and salmonberry, they peeled the shoots and ate those in the springtime. The salmon berries called lila. Also the two species of elderberries, you can cook the berries and eat those. Don't eat the berries raw. Um, they, the seeds can be quite toxic, so it's better to cook them always, especially the red, huck, the red elderberry. Soapberries, squaysome a favorite fruit that used to be much more common, but uh, people whip the berries, they mash them and put uh, water with them or juice and whip them up into a frothy dessert. Still enjoyed today and people trade soap berries, sometimes say they're worth their weight in gold. Then the huckleberries and the blueberries all related to each other and to the commercial blueberries as well. There's about eight different kinds that people would harvest and make, make them into berry cakes or store them underwater for winter in the case of the bog cranberry. These are all really enjoyed even today. They're found, people love berry picky. They each have their own name, Maltzum, Shokem, Yechem, Squakchus is the red, red huckleberry. And then very quickly, because we're running out of time, um, the common camas, a staple vegetable in the old days that people would dig in huge numbers, millions of bulbs dug on Vancouver Island alone by uh, the Kawitsan and their neighbors. And they dug them from, again, here's, here's Luz Chin. We burn the ground area every few years. Comes from many different elders, the great grandfather Luzchim, along with Span, those kinds of places, other berries, the berries will grow. So the burned over areas produce not only lots of camas, but also those different berries. The ashes fertilize the ground. The strawberries would grow big after a fire. Skunk cabbage, the leaves, you don't eat them, but you can they have a waxy coating. You can use them uh, as a surface for spreading berries to, to dry in cakes for winter. And the stingy nettle, the source of twine, as I mentioned, very, very tough fiber on the stems. Um, used to sew the mats made from tule or cattail. And this is one at the UBC Museum, a couch and mat made from the tule stems, wool. So all of these um, uses are still ongoing. People are still using these plants and relying on them, maybe adapting them to more uh, recent times, but still relying on the plants and the territory so much. This whole territory of the Kawitsan the Kokmenim speaking peoples is important today as it ever was. And we need to respect the, these plants and the knowledge, uh, the confidentiality of some knowledge and concerns. We need to be aware that some of the medicines might not be safe if you don't prepare them properly. You can't just go out and, and uh, think 
that you know what you're doing. Some, some medicines can be harmful and you need to always consult someone who knows an expert either from that nation or uh, from the medical field before you go out and try uh, taking some of these medicines. And even with the edible plants, you have to know what you're doing, uh, how to prepare them and harvest them properly, or you might harm yourself. For example, the yarrow is a very popular medicine, but it has uh, thuyon in it, and it could be harmful if you take too much of it at once. So you have to be very aware if you're trying to treat yourself uh, with herbal medicine um, to, to know what you're doing and to take care of yourself. The, uh, the elders who hold this knowledge always worry about that as well as that the medicine might be over harvested by people who don't understand that it needs to be harvested in special ways. We have the bare stem parsley, the chakmin, a very important aromatic plant in the carrot celery family, also very medicinal and spiritual. And another spiritual plant, the wild ginger. And that, uh, that ends my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm going to try and stop sharing my screen and make a bit of time available for questions now. Thank you so much. Nancy, thank you so much. That was so fascinating. Um, so we do have some time for questions. So folks, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A and I will um, ask Nancy some of the questions. And while you're doing that, uh, if anyone wants to purchase the book, uh, Luz Chim and yes. Nancy's book, uh, you can pick up a copy at Kids Books in Edgemont Village, and you can also visit uh, the Kids Books website, kidsbooks.ca, and you can order it to pick up in store, or they can deliver it to your house as well. Um, okay, so a couple of questions. Nancy, do you know of a plant that can be used for a teething baby? Oh my goodness. Baby medicines are really have to be handled with great care. Um, I'd need to think about that. Uh, perhaps also, um, Kendra, you could share my email with <laughs> the person who asked that question. Yeah. And um, I, I will do some research on that. I, I know there are some, but they don't come to mind right offhand. Um, yeah, I will follow yeah. up with her. Yeah, I can, I can almost hear what an elder was telling me about that, that, that there's certain, I know what it was, okay? Yeah. I remember what I was thinking was I heard about a soother for babies that's made from abalone. <laughs> and, uh, and this is not from Luzchin's territory, it's from further up the coast, I was told before abalones were so rare because they were commercially harvested, that they would make a baby soother by taking an, a young uh, abalone um, from the shell and putting a stick through it and having the baby suck on that, which is different from actually teething, yeah. but it's a soother. Yeah, <laughs> Anyways, so that's fascinating. That's a little bit different, but just something that comes to mind when we talk about babies. But I'd have, be happy to do some more research about that. Okay, great. Um, so another question, do you know of any plants that were especially important for end of life times and end of life ceremonies? Oh, again, I wish Luz Chin was here with me because um, he'd be able to talk about that uh, so much better. I know that the, the aromatic plants um, are, are especially valued uh, for, for people who are sick. And um, even things like cedar boughs, I've, I've heard many people, not just this team, but many people tell me uh, in the old days, the elders would have a big pot on the back of the stove with the Western red cedar just simmering. And the, um, the fragrance from the boughs 
would just permeate the house and it's very soothing for people who are sick. Um, the yarrow, the same thing. Many aromatic plants, including, um, let's see, I brought, yeah, I have these, um, these are the kachmin, the yellow, uh, sorry, the, um, they call it, they used to call it Indian consumption plant. You can call it wild celery, has a very strong scented seed and people make a soothing tea from it, as well as using it uh, to burn in the first salmon ceremony and as an aromatic uh, scent or smoke if you're, um, if you're purifying a house or something like that. So the, it's mostly, and wild rose is another one. If you, uh, if you have some wild rose branches and you can steam those on the top of the stove and breathe the vapor, um, people would say that's very soothing and helpful for, uh, for sick people. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Um, okay, so can you share any more about the burning associated with Gary Oak areas? Oh. And do you know anything about the Gary Oak areas in the Fraser Estuary? Oh, yes, that's a great question. Um, now, I don't want to make mistakes, but there are two populations of Gary Oaks uh, on the, in the lower mainland, one around Agassiz, I think, and one, uh, I don't want to make a mistake, um, closer to the ocean. Um, and one of those is genetically related to the population of Gary Oaks in the Comox Valley. They've done some genetic research on that, which I'd be happy to share um, later. Again, if you want to give that person my email address, I can send, uh, I can send papers about uh, traditional burning practices. And um, there's uh, uh, work that's done on burning around um, the Salmonos, uh, Gary Oak Preserve, uh, and now what was the rest of that question, Kendra? I missed, <laughs> I was so busy talking about the genetics of Gary Oak. But. No, that's okay. Uh, and then the question was about um, the Gary Oak areas in the Fraser Estuary specifically. Yeah, I don't know if there's any in the Fraser Estuary per se. Maybe I'm wrong. I might have that wrong, but certainly we there is evidence that people actually transplanted oak, uh, probably uh, acorns, brought acorns with them from one place to another. And so isolated populations can, in, can be an indicator, not necessarily uh, a proof because squirrels and other, uh, and birds can also transport acorns from one place to another. But, um, but it's an indication if you put it with the linguistic evidence. We certainly know that hazelnuts um, would have, would have, were transported and maybe transplanted uh, quite dis far distant areas from the Cowichan and Musqueam uh, lower mainland because uh, the name, the Proto-Salish, the very original Salish language name for hazelnut is Tsik, Tsik. And the, the Niska and Giksan names for hazelnut are Tsik. And that, those languages are not related to Salish. And uh, they're found, well, we know there's a town named Hazelton up on the Skeena River named after hazelnuts. So there's an isolated population, quite an extensive one, along the Skeena River. And because of the linguistic connection between uh, there and the Proto-Salish, that's a good indicator that hazelnuts were transplanted or brought up there a long, long time ago, thousands of years ago, maybe. But again, we don't have proof of that. Right. Um, so someone has shared that they were given salmon skin for teething and that her daughter loved it. Oh, that's a great example. That that's, yes. Time. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Yeah, so this question is coming in from a few people. Um, essentially, as a non-Indigenous person, 
who is interested in foraging and traditional medicines and traditional plants, um, what is a respectful way to um, enter into this field and into this work and to avoid cultural appropriation uh, and just to be respectful in how they go about that? Do you have some, some guidelines? Yeah, it's, um, that's a really, really important question, especially as I mentioned, because we just passed the, the day of reconciliation and all of us who learn from Indigenous knowledge keepers need to be very aware of whose knowledge it is and how it's shared. Um, but my, my advice would be, don't hesitate to ask questions of people. If you're not sure about something, ask. In my experience, the elders that I've worked with, um, you know, they don't like you asking question after question after question, but something like asking advice about, um, is it okay if I share this information with my daughter? Or is it okay if I take this picture? Or is it okay, um, you know, to, to write about this? And they'll tell you, they'll be very frank with you. And as Liz Chima has been with me, um, I'm very respectful of the knowledge that he holds that I don't share, that he doesn't share with me, or even if he has shared with me, I don't share it more, more widely. In, in my uh, book on plants of Haida Gwaii, for example, I was asked, don't include medicine recipes because those are Haida privileged knowledge that they share amongst themselves, but they don't want other people they worry about people harming themselves if they try to use the medicine inappropriately. They worry about people over harvesting or not harvesting it properly. They worry about uh, the potential for commercializing a medicine, which would then harm it in terms of its availability for local people. So all of these reasons, um, all of them, though, in my experience over so many years, I find uh, the elders, the people who hold the knowledge, who speak the languages, they're very kind. And um, they will give you advice if you ask in a respectful way. And that's, I think, the best thing to do, just to make sure. I, I still ask advice all the time. And another thing is to make sure that people understand I'm sharing this knowledge with you uh, that was shared with me with the knowledge that it would be shared with you. This is something that um, it's a really good idea for people to know and understand. Um, and even if you don't know a particular use for a plant, if you know that it has a name and that it is used in a spiritual way, that will give you a raise respect for that plant and you will be more... Um, caring when you're out and you see it growing. Thank you. That's great, great advice. Um, can you speak about some of the uses for snowberries? Yes. Okay. You all know snowberry, waxberry, it's also called. It's in the honeysuckle family. And you, you don't eat the berries. They're not, they're not considered uh, edible. Up chaos. In the, uh, in the Sanchasan language, that means little white revenge berries. <laughs> and um, so you don't eat them, but they're used, uh, some people use them to remove warts. Uh, and uh, one medicinal use that's in our uh, Sanich Ethnobotany, the book that we did with the Saanich elders with Richard Hebda, another botanist. Um, they boiled the branches and used them uh, for treating um, para paralysis of the limbs. You can also use the sticks of the waxberry uh, to string clams on for smoking uh, for, and for, mat for needles sometimes if you get a nice long one. Um, and, and there are various other medicinal uses. 
uh, even in in the interior, some people say you can swallow if you have uh, uh, if eaten too much fatty food. If you swallow one berry, it will dispel that feeling of um, you know indigestion that you have. But uh, I don't recommend that really because we don't know um, how poisonous those those berries are. My friend Christopher Paul. Uh, my first teacher, I say, from the Saanich Nation, told me uh, when I first was learning from him in the late 60s, he said a little girl in their community was killed by eating those berries. Mm -hmm. I've always remembered that. Yeah. I just wanted to show you the walking stick that Liz Chin had made for me, made of wild cherry, and also a yew wood digging stick. And a really important implement for digging, much nicer than a shovel. Yeah, oh, it's fascinating. All right, well, we um, are a little over our time, but that's okay, yes. Nancy. This was so, so, so wonderful. And I'm so grateful to you for being here. Um, and please extend my thanks to this team as well for being I'm willing cool. to share this incredible knowledge. Um, I've been reading through the book and I absolutely love it. Um, so thank you again, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, again, if you would like one of those signed book plates, please send me an email and I will pass that information on to Nancy. Uh, there were many more questions than we had time to answer, so I will pass those on to Nancy as well, and hopefully she can answer them, you know, through the coming days and weeks. And again, thank you everyone. I'll do my best. Yes, and thank you, Nancy. Okay, thank you, Kendra. Thank you all of you for attending. Um, um, I wish I could actually see your faces there um, but yeah. it's nice really nice to be with you all yeah thank you again and okay. again thank you everyone for joining us and uh, hopefully we'll see you again at another program soon have a great day okay. bye everyone <laughs>